we haven't seen this morning and those that are back again. It's good to be able to worship God together in spirit and in truth. And thank you all for coming back tonight. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. 2015, the YouVersion Bible app. If you have a phone or maybe a tablet, you might have this Bible app. YouVersion is an application that produces the Bible in several versions. Well, they ran a survey in 2015, and what they were trying to figure out was, what are the most popular Bible verses that are shared? And among those was Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 talks about be anxious or be careful for nothing. Romans 15, 13 was on the list. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. And the last one on the list was Romans 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed, but be transformed. Surprisingly, John 3, 16 didn't make the list. But John 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world, is probably the favorite or the golden text of the Bible it's been called. It's been translated into more than a thousand different languages. A lot of people don't have the whole Bible in other countries, but... They do have John 3 and verse 16. There's a new favorite verse emerging in our times, though. It's not John 3, 16. It's not any of the ones mentioned in the version survey that they conducted. It is Matthew 7 and verse 1. If you look at Matthew 7 and verse 1, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, this is becoming everybody's favorite verse. The non-Christian hurls this at the Christian. Even sometimes Christians will bow to the Matthew 7 and verse 1 philosophy of many. It just simply says in different terms. It said different ways. So you call something sin, and the reply is often, only God can judge me. You say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong. Hey, aren't you Christians, individuals that aren't supposed to judge? You're not supposed to judge people. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? And people will tout Matthew 7, verse 1, all the way down through verse 5 most times as sort of a proof text to keep a Christian from judging. So tonight's lesson is going to deal with this idea, to judge or not to judge. What does Jesus really teach in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5? Does Jesus outlaw all judgment? Are there times in my life when I shouldn't judge? Evidently, Jesus teaches something. Just what exactly does he teach? Does Jesus seem to teach in these verses that I must be perfect before I approach someone else? You know, the people teach and they'll say, you can't judge anybody's sin. All of us have sin. And how does this work with me identifying sin, rebuking error, and doing my best to live the Christian life while also not violating what Jesus teaches in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5? Let's go through these verses tonight, and let's notice some things that Jesus says about judging. We're going to notice first what these verses do not teach. So what Jesus was not teaching in Matthew 7, 1 to 5. Secondly, we're going to notice times when we are commanded to judge and when we must do so. And a failure to do so would put us on God's bad side. And then in the last place, we'll notice just what exactly was Jesus teaching in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, it shall, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, shall be measured again unto you. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, and consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or will you say to your brother, let me pull out the mote that's in your eye, and behold, there's a beam in your eye. Jesus says, you hypocrite. First, cast the, moat, cast the beam out of your eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the moat that's in your brother's eye. Number one tonight, Jesus does not teach in these verses that the Christian can never judge anybody. If you look closely at Matthew 7 and verse 1, and if we really take it on the face value and the way that it's read in many circles today, it simply says, judge not and what? You won't be judged. So if I want to escape judgment, all I have to do is don't ever judge anybody. But 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or evil. So just merely refraining from judging individuals won't help me to escape divine judgment. There's a sense in which all of us will stand before God. Jesus in Matthew 7 is dealing with this type of judicial judgment, where I sit in the seat of judge and I mete out righteousness and I use my own standard to do this. This is where I simply set up rules for myself on what I think is right, what I think is evil. And I hold people to this standard to make myself feel good, to make myself feel better than them. And I don't have their best interests at heart. Jesus isn't teaching that we can't ever judge. I heard Jackie Steersman say one time, and he was right. He said, you know, whenever somebody teaches error from a verse, 
Just continue to read, and most times the truth pops up in the next few verses. It's true about what we're discussing tonight. Look at verse 6. Jesus says, Give not that which is holy to dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them beneath their feet and turn again and rend you. Jesus says, Don't give that which is holy to dogs, and then he talks about giving that which is give pearls to swine. What Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7 and verse 6 is our evangelism tactic. So what Jesus says is this. Be careful about throwing the truth of the gospel out to people that won't accept it. Some people, they're like dogs. They don't really want the truth. They're like pigs. They won't. You don't want to give them your pearls. Jesus says you need to make sure that you use wisdom in sharing the gospel with these people because if you don't, you'll waste the truth of the gospel. Well, Jesus, if I can't ever judge anybody, if it's always wrong to cast any kind of judgment, tell me how can I figure out if this person's a dog or if they're a pig or a swine, how can I make this decision if all judgment is always outlawed based on Matthew 7 and verse 1? Look at Philippians chapter 3. Sometimes the New Testament uses this word dog, and it's not talking about man's best friend in that sense. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Long before man ever had that on his gate, on his property, Paul said, beware of dogs. How can I beware of dogs, Paul, if I can never judge? You see, Jesus is saying, I need to use wisdom in how I share the gospel with people, and this will require me to make a judgment. Now, how do I determine if somebody's worthy of the gospel or not? Well, this is a hard decision. And I need to make sure that I ask for wisdom when I do this. Look at Matthew 7 and look at what Jesus follows this up with. So in 7 verses 1 through 5, he says, don't judge. And then in verse 6, he says, don't give that which is holy to dogs. And you might wrestle with, how do I know when this person has gotten to this point that they just can't be reached? Verse 7, Jesus says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open. For everyone that asks, receive, and he that seeks, finds, and to him that knocks, it is open." Jesus says right after this, we often use these verses to talk about general prayer, and I suppose that's true, but what Jesus is talking about in the immediate context is this. You're going to need a little help in discerning who is a dog and who is a swine. You're going to need help, and the only way you'll figure this out and get it right is you need to make sure that you ask God. How else do I know that Jesus in these verses does not teach that it's always wrong to judge? I can never make any type of distinction. Look at Matthew 7 and look down a few more verses at verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He says, You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby by their fruits you shall know them. Jesus, how can I call a man a false prophet if I can't ever make a judgment? Beware of false prophets. That means something that this person is going to teach, I'm going to have to make a discernment and be able to say, hey, this guy's a false teacher. And then Jesus goes a step further and says, by their fruits or by their actions, you'll be able to make a determination. You see, when somebody throws out Matthew 7, 1 as a proof text, we don't need to get back on our heels and simply say, yeah, you're right, I can never judge this person. You say, hey, he's a false teacher, and they say, well, no, you can't judge him. Jesus says, I must. He says, I want you to be aware of false prophets. They come to you in these clothes, and you need to be sure that you properly dissect them and make sure that you don't follow them into their error. We need to be those individuals that scrutinize what we hear, and the only way that we can do this is if we make a judgment. Jesus doesn't teach in these verses that I can never judge, that I can never make a distinction between what's right and wrong, that I can never call someone else out on sin. John chapter 8 and verse 7, Jesus is approached by a mob of people. They bring this woman. She's caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus says, the one that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. That verse is often thrown right alongside this one and says, see, none of you are without sin. Jesus isn't teaching there that I have to be without sin before I correct anybody, because if that was the case, we never correct anybody, right? Because who's going to ever be without sin? 
The first thing to know about these verses tonight is Jesus does not outlaw all judgment because in the remainder of the chapter, he gives us some evidence of times when we must make a judgment. Now, what are some specific times when the Christian must judge? There are specific times when I'm commanded to judge. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and look at verse 24. In John chapter 5, Jesus heals, he heals a lame man. He heals a blind individual. And the Pharisees and the authorities, they get upset. It's the Sabbath. Jesus, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And his controversy carries all the way over to John chapter 7. And in verse 24, Jesus says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus says, when you make a judgment, he almost assumes that you will. He doesn't say, don't ever judge me or anything I teach. He says, when you do, make sure that it's a righteous judgment. Jesus pulls this from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19 and verse 15 and verse 35 also, which teach the Jews were not supposed to look on a man's outward appearance and determine whether or not he was worthy to be received or to be respected. Jesus says, I want you to judge righteous judgment. How do I do that? I always use the right standard and not my own. I always look at what the Word of God says about something, and then I make a determination in John 7, what Jesus is teaching there in verse 23, he says, even on the Sabbath, if it falls on the eighth day, you circumcise someone to keep the law of Moses. Why are you upset at me? Because I made a man completely whole on the Sabbath day. Jesus is saying, I want you to reason. Use common sense and judge righteous judgment. In our lives, we need to make sure, you know, you might go to a congregation and then they might do something a tad different than we do it here and I need to be careful that I don't jump to the conclusion, well, evidently, those folks are liberal, they're different. Jesus would say, it's okay to make a judgment there, but I want you to make sure that you judge the righteous judgment, use the right standard. Number two, the church must point out and correct blatant sin in the local congregation. The times when we must judge is when we see blatant sin in the congregation, the New Testament demands that we judge those things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians 5 and look at verse 9. Paul says, I wrote to you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I've written to you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. But what have I to judge them that are also without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves the wicked person. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems. Just about every chapter, Paul's writing to correct some error. But in chapter 5, there's this big stink about a man that has his father's wife, so presumably his stepmother. And Paul says, you Corinthians, you're sitting there rather puffed up. You should be mourning this occasion. Somebody should step up and say something. In verses 9 through 13, Paul simply says, you know, if this was a worldly person, it wouldn't be a surprise. But if a person says he's a brother and he's involved in these sins, he says you have a responsibility to judge him or her. You have to do something about this to keep the local congregation pure. You can't just let sin run rampant. And notice Paul highlights specific sins. Railer, covetous, drunkard, wouldn't be anything wrong with a person saying in the local congregation, hey, this person's drinking, he's a drunkard, you can't continue to do that. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul says, if anybody doesn't obey the words that we've written to you, you need to withdraw from that person and have nothing to do with them. Church discipline. I know a lot of people, a lot of congregations don't practice it, but Paul says it's a necessity. If we're going to be the church of the New Testament, the church you read about in the Bible, there are times when we must judge, and some of those times are when we see blatant sin in the congregation. Paul says, if you see a person running around in this lifestyle and they just simply will not repent, the burden is on the local church to do something about it. Paul says, those are times when you must judge. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 1, Paul says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge the angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If ye then have judgments pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Paul says there's a time in which the local congregation in Corinth, they would have disputes. They would have disagreements. And the way that they would settle this when they couldn't get along was they'd go before the court in Corinth and they'd try to let the legal system determine who's right or wrong. Paul says, you're Christians. Shouldn't one of you be able to judge and figure this thing out? Shouldn't the least in the church be able to figure out the matters that you all are disputing over? There's a time when Christians must judge among themselves and settle our own grievances and not go before the unbeliever, Paul says. I don't want you to sue each other and take each other to court. You judge within the local congregation among yourselves, right versus wrong, and make the distinction and solve the issue yourself. You see, these situations prove that Matthew 7, 1 can't always be used to say we must never judge. Paul says Christians will judge angels and we'll also judge the world. When are some other times that the Christian is commanded to judge? We need to be prepared to judge false teachers. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, Paul says, Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Paul says, I need to test and prove everything. 1 John 4 and verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or test the spirits, whether they be of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's a burden on the person in the pew to judge every time somebody stands before them to preach. I must always have an open Bible and discern whether or not this person is preaching or teaching truth. If I fail to do so, 2 John 9 through 11 says, If a person comes to you and brings false doctrine, don't receive him into your house or bid him or her Godspeed. For if you bid them Godspeed, you partake of their evil deed. What does that mean? John's saying, if I take this idea that, hey, I can't judge anybody. I don't know what he teaches. I can't call him or her a false teacher. If you cast your approval on them, John says, you partake in their wickedness, you'll be held accountable. Acts 17 and verse 11 says, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul was teaching was true. What's that all about? It's not just about Bible study. We use Acts 17, 11, and we say, you need to study your Bible every day like the Bereans did. Well, the Bereans weren't engaged in devotional Bible study. The Bereans were scrutinizing Paul and his companions to make sure what they were teaching was true. You have to judge teachers to determine whether or not they're teaching truth. But this is probably the biggest one in our society. The sins of the world must be pointed out and be judged so that individuals will repent. Somebody's engaged in homosexuality and you say, you know what, you, shouldn't, you, you can't live like that and go to heaven. You can't judge those folks. Hey, this man's engaged in adultery. Hey, listen, none of us is without sin. You can't judge that individual. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. Look what Paul says about sins taking place with the Gentile world in Romans chapter 1. Now, Paul's not talking about people that are Christians here. He's talking about people that are outside of Christ, they're in the world, and he lists the sins that they commit. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And then in verse 20, not, 21, he says, When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So Paul talks about first the atheist, and then he talks about the person that practices idolatry. Look at verse 26. Verse 26. 
Paul says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was due. Paul comes out and he calls homosexuality wrong. Doesn't Paul know Matthew 7 and verse 1, judge not? Paul, don't you know you can't say that about those people? Jesus doesn't want you judging. But if we don't do this, we fall under God's banner of wrath. Look at verse 32. He says, who know in the judgment of God that they that do such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Verse 32 is going to trip a lot of people up at the judgment. In verses 18 through 31, Paul lists a variety of sins, covetousness, idolatry, homosexuality, and he talks about all of these sins of the Gentile world. And then in verse 32, he says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they that practice such things are worthy of death, they don't do them, but they have pleasure in them that do them. That means I don't live this lifestyle, but I applaud people that do. I wouldn't practice this sin, but I won't correct it. I'll just simply say, you know, that's just their lifestyle. It's not for me to judge. It's just... That's the way they are. Paul says, you know the judgment of God. And if you cast approval on wrongdoing, if you don't stand up and say, hey, that's wrong, if you don't make a judgment, he says the wrath of God also abides on that individual. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and look at verse 12. Paul talks about the people in Crete, and he says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, says, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And then he says, This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Paul comes right out, and he calls a whole group of society, a whole group of people, he says, Listen, they're always liars. They're evil beasts. They're slow bellies. In our society, that's politically incorrect. You don't just lump a whole group of people together and say, They always lie. They're lazy. Somebody will say, Matthew 7 and 1 says, judge not. But Paul realizes something. Paul says, you know what? People cannot change until they know they're in sin. The medication means nothing to a man until he first understands his sickness. We have to point out error and we have to point out sin. Now, sometimes the Christian is uneasy about doing this. Somebody says, hire him, listen. I'm not perfect. Who am I to stand up and point out somebody's error? Who am I to say, listen, this is wrong, that lifestyle is wrong. We're all sinners. And therein lies our problem. Sometimes we use bad terminology when we talk about sinning and sinners. The Christian is not a sinner. He or she might commit incidental or isolated acts of sin, but God doesn't look at that person as a sinner. Look at 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, and look at what he says in verse 6. Sometimes we pray this way. We say, God, just forgive us. You know, we're all sinful people. And that's not true. It shouldn't be true. And if I'm going to be a faithful Christian, it can't be. Look at First John 3 and look at verse 6. He says, Whosoever abides in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Now verse 9, he says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. John doesn't mean that the Christian never commits an act of sin. That's not what he teaches. But what he means is the faithful child of God, he or she does not live a lifestyle of habitual sin. You don't just go on sinning. So it's always wrong to call Christians sinners. It's always wrong to say we're sinful people. John says you can't be that way and be a Christian. His seed remains in you, and you just can't go on sinning. From Matthew all the way through Revelation, once a person obeys the gospel, God never calls that person a sinner again. He'll address isolated acts. He'll address mistakes. He'll try to fix things. He never looks at any Christian in the New Testament and says, Now listen, you sinners at Corinth, you need to do better. Hey, listen, church at Philippi, I know you're all sinful, not once. If we realize this idea that the Bible teaches that once a person obeys the gospel, he or she is in a saved relationship, and all of those outside of Christ, those are the ones that are literally in sin, it makes this a lot easier. 
This idea that we're all sinners and nobody can correct anybody is just simply not true. Those that walk in the light have their sins continually cleansed by the blood of Christ, and they bear responsibility to confront the watching world with their error so that they might do better. The last one, we're often commanded to judge. We need to judge ourselves. Acts 13 and verse 46, Paul is preaching there to a group of people. They don't want the truth. And Paul says, seeing that you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we'll turn to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, Paul says, but let a man examine himself. Just bring out all these verses to say, Jesus does not condemn all judging. There are times throughout the Bible where we're told to judge, judge false teachers. Paul judges the world around him in the first century and says, listen, these people are engaged in specific sins. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul lists the works of the flesh. And then at the end, Paul says, the people that practice these things, they can inherit the kingdom of God. Is it wrong to say to somebody, hey, if you don't stop drinking, you can't go to heaven? Paul says, if you do these things, you just don't inherit the kingdom of God. We need to stand up and say what the Bible says in the way that it says it. In the last place tonight, what does Jesus mean? Because he does mean that there's a kind of judgment that I can't do. So I can't read these verses and say, Hiram, great, you gave me ammunition this week. I can go out and say whatever I want. There is a kind of judgment that Jesus prohibits here. And he says, you don't want to be found doing this. Look at Matthew 7 again. Matthew 7, beginning with verse 1. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why do you behold the mote that's in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the beam that is in your own eye? Or how would you say to your brother, let me pull out the mote that is in your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to cast out the mote that is in your brother's eye. Jesus is talking about the sin of hypocrisy. The Bible talks about a lot of sin, idolatry, murder, fornication. There isn't a sin in the Bible that God hates more than the sin of hypocrisy. God hates the hypocrite, the person that puts up a facade, puts up a front, puts burdens on others that he or she will not bear. When Jesus says, judge not, what he means is this. Don't you set up a standard of righteousness aside from the Bible and say, all of the really religious people, they really do this. You know, all of the really spiritual people, they wear a tie on Sunday night. And if you want to be right with God, you're going to do it this way. You see, sometimes we're guilty of setting up our own standard of righteousness and saying everybody must come underneath this in order to be right with God. Look at Matthew 23. Jesus has the Pharisees in mind in Matthew 7, and in Matthew 23, he gives a better description of just what exactly he's talking about as he relates to the type of judgment he does not want us to perform. Matthew 23, beginning with verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. That's the hypocrisy. Jesus is saying they tell people to do something, and then they don't do it themselves. He says they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and they love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue. In the first century, the Pharisees, they took Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, literally. God told the children of Israel, listen, I want you to put the law before your children's eyes and bind it as frontlets. Well, the Pharisees had sort of like these visors, and they would put scriptures in these blocks so that it was always before them. It helped them to memorize these passages, and it was a good thing at first. But then they took it to the nth degree, and basically, whoever could fit the most scriptures in this little block, he was the more religious. And of course, the longer their gowns were, Jesus says they brought in their garments, the longer your gown was, the more righteous you were. And Jesus condemns this hypocrisy and he says, just wait a minute. Why are you judging people based on a man-made standard? You just do the things that you want and you say all of the spiritual people. Jesus says, I don't want you making judgments like this. In James chapter 4, 11 through 12, James says there is one judge and one lawgiver and that's God. There are some times in our lives when we must never judge. 
Look at Romans chapter 2 for one of those times. When I'm engaged in a sin myself, I must never try to condemn or correct someone else that's engaged in the same thing. Romans chapter 2, and look at verse 21. Well, Romans chapter 2, let's start with verse 1. He says, Therefore you are inexcusable, old man, whosoever you are that judge, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge, do you not do the same things? Look at verse 21. He says, Therefore thou that teaches another, do you not teach yourself? And you that preaches that another man should not steal, do you steal? You that say a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhors idols, do you not commit sacrilege? There are times in our lives when I'm under the weight of a certain sin, I must never be the one pointing that out in somebody else. Don't go to anybody else and say anything about bad language when I curse when nobody's looking. Don't condemn the homosexuality community when I don't come out and say, hey, that fornication is equally wrong. Don't condemn murder, but at the same time say, well, I really don't think there's anything wrong with abortion. He says, don't get caught in the sin of hypocrisy. You need to make sure that you do not judge a person when you're engaged in the very same act. I also don't need to judge someone when I have no intention of helping them spiritually. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and look at verse 1. If I don't have any, any chance in my mind that I'm going to, if I don't, have, I don't have any motive that I'm going to try to help a person, it's better off that I don't say anything. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider in thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you see a brother overtaken in a fault, he says, I want you to go and help him and restore him in the spirit of meekness. And consider yourself, because it could also be you. If I don't intend to help a person, if I'm just gossiping, I don't need to say anything. I had a slogan, I just had it for myself a few years ago, try to keep it in mind. You know, when I see people out, if you're not going to evangelize, don't criticize. Sometimes it's easy to point out and say, now why is she wearing that? That's not modest. Do you have any plans of saying anything to her about the Lord, about event? You know, it's real easy to sit back and say, that's wrong, but do you want to do anything to help or change the situation? You see, if you're not going to help a person, there's no need in doing anything. Paul says, you which are spiritual restore such a one. That means if a brother's overtaken in a, in a fault and I'm not spiritual, Paul says, it'll be best for you just to stay at home. You just make matters worse. I must never be the one to try to judge a person when I don't have any inclination. I'm not in any way going to help or make things better. Jesus doesn't want us committing hypocritical judgment, and I need to guard against it. What do we learn from this tonight? To point out that something is wrong is not a bad thing. Don't let people pin you in a corner with Matthew 7 and 1 and say, well, you know, what do you think about that? Well, I can't judge that person. Isaiah 5 and verse 20 says, Woe to them that call good evil and evil good, cast light for darkness and darkness for light, call sweet bitter and bitter for sweet. Don't let people trick you out of using Matthew 7 and verse 1 that you can never call anything sin. I read something the other day. A man said, the greatest sin in our time is calling anything sin. You can do whatever you want, but if you say that something's wrong, society will jump all over you. Matthew 7 and verse 1 cannot be used to hush the Christian. There are certain judgments we need to make, and if we fail to make them, we might fall into the same condemnation of others. We need to be people that help those in error see that they're in error. And we need to use the proper standard in judgment. Jesus says, I don't want you to judge according to appearance. But I want you to judge righteous judgment. You know, we don't have the phylacteries that the Pharisees used to use. We don't wear the long garments anymore. But it's possible to sit in a self-righteous seat. It's possible to look out on others and make up our own minds. You know, there's one thing that we can't do. And I think this is at the heart of what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 7. You can't judge a person's motive. Now, you can look at the fruit and you can see a person doing a certain action. But just be careful about getting into the heart and saying, I think he did this because of this reason. Then Matthew 7 and verse 1 would be appropriate. Judge not that you be not judged. The same standard that we use when we make judgments is going to be used against us in the day of judgment. Let us use God's standard and not our own.
Tonight, if you're not a Christian, the truth is that you are in a lost state. It's not me casting a wrong judgment. It's just what the Bible teaches. If you want to be a Christian, you need to obey the gospel of Christ the way that he says. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not should be condemned. If you need the prayers of the Christians tonight or you want to be encouraged with our prayers, we'll pray with you and pray for you. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement. If you need to respond, come now. It's together we sing this song. <laughs>